The subject matter for the, the sermon this morning is about a topic that I think, it's actually one word that a lot of people are confused over the meaning of this word. It's a word that isn't used commonly anymore in English in, in our day-to-day -day talking, which I think that uh, is part of the reason why there's some confusion about it. And it's also something that has been um, completely abused in many churches on, on what the actual meaning is. And that word is repent. That's a Bible word. We see that, that quite a few times in the Bible, actually. It's used very frequently. But it's a word that's been used and abused by very, very many churches to teach a works-based salvation. Now, we're going to go into is I'm going to lay all, all the evidence out for you. I'm going to explain why, uh, what people do are wrong. But um, and, and I don't think I've ever done this before from the pulpit, you know, in, in a church service of actually calling out a specific church in town. But we need to mark and identify people who are doing wicked, you know, who are preaching a false gospel for one. And I, th I have not found any church in my lifetime of going out and preaching the gospel and talking to people and getting to know people and, and, and definitely you know, doing individual talking, getting to know everyone's background, their story, what churches they've been to. I don't know of any one church that's, that has been working for Satan more than the Potter's House. Amen. And the Potter's House is right here in town. Okay. And they are, they are active. Look, they are very active. They're going out and doing all kinds of things. And I just had someone come to my door yesterday handing out, you know, a, a flyer. They've got a concert going on. They've got their Club 180, which is all trendy and try, cool looking, trying to attract the young crowd. They had kids walking up and down the streets doing all the work for them. And what they do is they preach a, a horribly false doctrine, another gospel, and we're going to call them out. And that's why we started here in, in Jeremiah chapter 18. It actually has the reference to the potter's house here in Jeremiah 18. Now, I don't know enough about the foundation of their church to know if this is specifically where they get their name from, but it probably is because it's only referenced like a couple times in the Bible when we talk about the potter and the, and the, you know, and the clay. And uh, look at there in verse number one of Jeremiah 18. The Bible reads, The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause thee to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a work on the wheels, and the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter, so he made it again another vessel, as seemed good to the potter to make it. Now, there's obviously, you know, this is the Bible, there's truth to this, but what they do is they take the truth and they twist it and they pervert it into something that it's not saying. It, <laughs> the gospel that they preach is that you have to repent of your sins in order to be saved. Now, I'm sure people probably heard this in many other places other than just the potter's house. Now, I'm singling them out because they, I mean, they, they are so bad it's not even just to repent of your sins. I talk to people, they turn people away from church left and right. Now, it's one thing where people get turned away from church when you're preaching the true word of God. I mean, you know, the Bible is going to offend some people. But I've talked to people over and over again, countless times, where they said, yeah, they're just, you know, they're, they're constantly on you about how you live. They say that, you know, if you're not living a certain way, you can lose your salvation. If you backslide, you're going to hell. I mean, that's what they teach. They teach that if you don't, you know, if you're not doing the works, you're going to hell. And that you have to get saved. I was talking to a kid yesterday. He said, you got to get saved every day. Get saved every day. I said, I thought I have eternal life. I mean, eternal means forever, isn't it? Right. I mean, if I have eternal life, I get one time. I'm saved. That's, I'm good, right? Jesus paid for my sins once. I'm not going to bear, bear you know, to an open shame by getting saved over and over and over again. What he did was sufficient the first time I called on him for my salvation. But here's what they'll use to say, okay, yeah, the potter's house. But now let's see what this is teaching, right? Because obviously you've got a potter, he's making it work, it gets screwed up, and what happens? Well, it just, just let's start over on it again, right? And what I want to point out is this teaching, because this, this chapter here in Jeremiah 18, it talks about turning from their evil ways, okay? Which would be turning from your sins. Let's look and see what it says. It says, then the word of the Lord came to me, verse number 6, O house of Israel. So who's he talking to? Is he talking to a person? No. He's talking to the house of Israel, right? A whole group of people. Cannot I do with you as this potter? He's talking about the nation of Israel. 
saith the Lord, Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in mine hand, O house of Israel. At what instance I shall speak, look at this, concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck up and to pull down and to destroy it. If that nation against whom I have pronounced turn from their evil, I will repent of the evil that I thought to do unto them. And at what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to build and to plant it. If it do evil in my sight that it obey not my voice, then I will repent of the good wherewith I said I would benefit them. And the works-based salvation crowd that uses this phrase, you know, you have to repent of your sins in order to be saved, will always turn to verses, mostly in the Old Testament, that are like this. Now, this is very clear. Anyone, if you just read this and take it at service value for what it's saying and look at who he's talking to and look at what he's talking about, it's clear. I mean, over and over again, he says, I'm talking about a nation. I'm talking to the house of Israel because that's the way that God works with nations because you know what? Nations don't have a soul. Nations don't experience an eternal salvation with God. Nations are temporal in this lifetime. They, they, they exist on this earth. So for a nation to survive, for a nation to exist and not be judged of God, they have to be doing good works. I mean, they have to be doing right and not doing a bunch of wickedness. When nations, any nation, I don't care who, what the nation is, when nations start to do wickedly, what happens? The judgment of God comes upon them. And I preach an entire sermon just about this one topic alone. It's called the salvation of a nation. And when you're looking at verses in the Bible, always, always, always get the context. Because someone that's trying to teach you something and try to teach you a false doctrine is going to rip out a verse here and there to try to prove what they're saying to be true. Read it in context. In this one, it's pretty hard to even yank this out of context because he says he's talking to the house of Israel, he's talking to the nation, I mean, in every single verse that he's talking about them turning from their evil. In verse 80, it even says, if that nation against whom I have pronounced turn from their evil, I will repent of the evil that I thought to do unto them. Now, this alone is a great example anyways of what I'm preaching this morning because who's doing the speaking there in verse 8? That's God. God is saying, if a nation against whom I pronounce turn from their evil, I will repent. So we see God is repenting there. And, you know, a conversation I had yesterday, I asked a person to define repent. Well, what does repent mean? Just define it for me. What does the word repent mean? And they said to turn from your sins. I said, well, does God sin? Well, no, of course not. Then why does God repent in the Bible? You see, we have to understand, and look, this is a common definition, and even if you find it in some dictionary somewhere, it says, turn from your sins, that is not an accurate definition. The only reason that would be in a modern dictionary is because that's how people are using the word today. But that's not the biblical definition. That is not the way the word was ever created for or used in the Bible. The word repent very simply means either to turn or to rethink. The, the most basic definition is to rethink. That word re is again, and the word pent is the, is the root word for thinking or being thoughtful. I think of, uh, I, I learned this word uh, pensive. From a very young age, I was reading a story, and I saw this word pensive as describing a child as being pensive. And I, didn't, I had no idea, what does that mean? And I asked my parents, what does this mean? And I looked it up, it says, thoughtful. If someone is penseful, just pensive, it means they're being very thoughtful. Well, it's the same root word as for repent. It's that pent part. It's to think again. Rethink. That's what the word repent means. Now, in the context, there are all kinds of things that you could repent of or repent from. In this verse, God was going to rethink or to change his mind about the evil that he thought to do unto a nation. And we're going to see that later when we get into Jonah chapter 3, how God spared the city of Nineveh, who was doing all kinds of wickedness. They were doing all kinds of bad things. Jonah was sent to preach unto them, and God was about to destroy them, but he gave them a warning first. And then he was planning on destroying them because of their wickedness, but because they changed their ways... God held off and said, fine, I'm not going to destroy you now. That is how it works 
with a nation. That is how the nations of the world work. If you are doing extreme wickedness, you know, and sometimes it gets to the point where God's going to judge you anyways. But if you haven't gone reprobate as a nation, there, you could still turn to God and God will uh, allow you to continue as a nation without judging you. Now turn, if you would, to Galatians chapter 1. And I just want to show this to you real quick because I've called out the potter's house by name. And we need to be aware of this church because they're not Christian at all, even though they claim the name of Christ. They're just like the Pharisees in Jesus' time. They claim the name of the Lord. They claim to believe in Moses. But Jesus said that they didn't believe in Moses because if they believed in Moses, they'd believe in him. Right. They claimed that religion. They claimed God. They claimed the Lord. But they didn't believe it at all. And there's a lot of people out there that claim the name of Jesus today, but they don't believe it at all. I mean, a Jehovah's Witness cult, that's another group that claims the name of Jesus, but they don't believe it at all. They don't even believe in the deity of Jesus Christ. There's so many people that claim a belief, but it doesn't mean that they actually are true Christians. The Bible says in Galatians chapter 1, look at verse number 6. This is what we're supposed to do, and this is one of the reasons why I'm preaching this message this morning. Galatians chapter 1, verse number 6, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Look at what he says, though. He says, how is it that you've come so quickly and now you're following some other gospel? But he explains a little bit further, verse 7, which is not another it's not just some completely different gospel, he says, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. So the gospel that he's talking about, it's not just like, oh, follow Muhammad because he's the Christ. That's a completely separate gospel that's, that would just be, you know, or, or follow Buddha or, you know, you know, Zen or Hinduism or something. These are completely other gospels. These are, these are completely separate. What he's talking about is people coming in and perverting the gospel of Christ. Saying, oh, the gospel of Christ, yeah, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Jesus Christ was, was crucified, died, and, and buried and rose again from the dead to, to pay for all of your sins and to give you eternal life. Perverting that gospel. Tweaking it. Changing it a little bit. Adding in some works, adding in something else. And in this time, you know, one of the common things was they were trying to add in circumcision. Say, well, you got to believe and be circumcised. You got to believe and keep some aspect of the law. And that's what they were trying to do. And they perverted the gospel of Christ. He says in verse 8, so what are we supposed to do? He's, he's warning them, saying, look, how are you so quickly removed from the gospel I gave you unto another gospel, which is not another, but it's per a perversion. Verse 8, but though we are an angel from heaven... He says, even if it comes from us or an angel from heaven, if you're talking to an angel, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that you have received, let him be accursed. Strong words, let him be accursed. And you know what? That's the attitude that I take when people come to my house and preach a perverted, false gospel. I will first try to give them the truth because I love them, I want them to be saved. But if they're going to try to tell me that the gospel of Jesus Christ is this perversion, that I have to do some works, then you know what? I'm going to let them be accursed because they need to be accursed because that's what the Bible says right here. That's what the Apostle Paul said. Let them be accursed. I'm not going to wish the Jehovah's Witness a good day and send them, bid them Godspeed on their way to go and spread a false gospel, a perversion of the gospel. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it when the potter's house comes either. They teach us perverted... Turn, if you would, to Exodus chapter 32. Actually, you know what? Skip that. We're going to go to Matthew 21. Just go to Matthew 21. I already proved this point. Exodus 32 is just another example of God repenting. We saw that in Jeremiah 18, Exodus, and it's actually all throughout the Old Testament. If you want to know who does more repenting than any other individual in the Bible, it's God. It's the Lord. Right. God does more of the repenting than anybody else. And if you don't believe me, go ahead and do a word study for yourself. Look it up. Look up repent. Look up repentance. Look up repented. And you'll see that God repents. Which right, right there alone should let you know that the word repent does not mean turn from your sin. God doesn't have any sin. 
But let's look at now, we're going to look at New Testament examples of repent. Because, and, and just another piece of information, when you run across people that are trying to tell you you have to turn from your sins and be saved, challenge them and say, where does it say that in the Bible? Because they'll throw things out there. And sometimes they'll throw things out there that, that are in the Bible. But don't just accept what they're saying. Always go back to the book and prove it. I had a conversation with a guy a few years ago, many years ago, about four, maybe five or six years ago. And we were having this conversation. I didn't realize until, and this is when, when the point really stuck home for me, is that we were talking about a completely separate topic. He's a you know, saved guy, brother in Christ, someone, one of my friends. But we were having this conversation about the Bible. And the biggest problem that we had when I walked away, because I, I was trying to explain something to him, and when I left that night, I was thinking about it. Why, you know, why, didn't, why couldn't he get it? You know, it's, he, you know, he just wasn't seeing it. And, and what I came away with was, we were talking about the Bible without going to the Bible. So we both had a different recollection of what the Bible actually said. And what he recalled the Bible saying was incorrect. And I realized that later because he had said something. But instead of challenging him and saying, well, let's look it up, I just kind of shifted a little bit in, 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 my, in, in my approach with talking to him. And when I went home, I looked it up and I realized, oh, yeah, what he said. I mean, because I knew something wasn't right with what he was saying, but I couldn't pinpoint it. And then when I went home and looked it up, I was like, oh, yeah, there it is because he misquoted it. He misread it. When you read it, that's not what it says at all. So the best thing you can do when you're talking about the Scripture, talking about Bible with somebody, is to open up the Bible and turn to it. And challenge someone. If they're going to try to tell you you've got to do works to be saved, you've got to turn from all of your sins to be saved, then show me in the Bible where it says that. You say, well, yeah, but the Bible says you have to repent. Yes, it does. And you know what? We're going to look at New Testament examples of that. Many New Testament examples of that. And we're going to see, is it saying we have to turn from our sins in order to be saved? Let's look at it. I mean, if it says it, then I'll believe it. But I've read it many times. It doesn't say that. Let's look at Matthew 21, verse 32. We see some repentance in the New Testament. Matthew 21, verse 32. The Bible reads, For John came unto you in the way of righteousness, and ye believed him not. And he's talking to the Pharisees. This is, this is the context. And you know what? Write these verses down if you want. Look them up later, because I'm going to just, you know, we're looking at small sections. Get them in context for yourself and see and judge whether or not I'm giving them to you in context or not, or if the context says something different. You ought to do that with everything that I preach, by the way. There's a lot of stuff I need to go through so I don't have time to read the entire chapter for everything that we're going to look at today, but challenge me on what I preach. Look it up for yourself and know whether or not what I'm saying is the truth. Do that with everybody. Matthew 21, 32 as Jesus is preaching, or is talking to the, to the Pharisees here, he says, For John came unto you in the way of righteousness, and ye believed him not. But the publicans and the harlots believed him. And ye, when ye had seen it, repented not afterward, that ye might believe him. Jesus is explaining, look, John came preaching. He was preaching the truth. You didn't believe him. Right? The Pharisees didn't believe John the Baptist. But you know who did believe him? The publicans, the harlots, these sinners, right? They came to John the Baptist. They received the message. They believed him, and they got saved. And he's saying, you saw all this happening. You saw the sinners coming and believing. And he says, and you still repented not afterward. You saw, you saw everything that's going on. You could see the fruit of John's ministry. You can see the converts. And you still didn't repent that ye might believe him. He said, you didn't repent, which restated here says that you might believe him. Nowhere does this say anything about their sins. Nowhere is this referring to them turning from their evil ways, right? I mean, the Pharisees were the people who were looked on as the most righteous anyways, right? Right? I mean, Jesus was telling the people, except your righteousness exceed that of the Pharisees, you shall in no wise enter in the kingdom of heaven. But what did they not do? They didn't change their minds. They didn't change their belief. They didn't decide, you know what, I will believe on John the Baptist. I will believe on the message of John the Baptist. Not believe on him, but believe on what he was preaching. Believe on that truth. Why? Because they were believing in something else. 
They had to change their mind. And this is, this is when it comes to salvation, everybody has to repent in the sense that you are believing in something else other than Jesus Christ alone for your salvation. You need to change whatever it is that you are believing in to get to heaven. For most people, it's the fact that, or the, the, the belief that they think they're a good person. The vast majority of people out there are saying, I'm going to heaven because I'm a pretty good person. I haven't ever killed anyone. I haven't, you know, I'm not a criminal. I haven't done anything that bad. That's why I'm saved. That's why I'm going to heaven when I die. You need to change what you believe if that's your belief. Anyone that has that belief of why they're going to heaven, they need to change. They need to repent. They need to rethink what they're believing on and what they're trusting on and put their faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. Pure and simple. But let's look at some more examples. Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1. I mean, that was Jesus Christ himself talking about repentance. We're going to see John the Baptist, he preached repentance. What's funny is that on the internet, people will label and say, oh, you know, Pastor Burson doesn't preach repentance. Yes, I do preach repentance. I just preach the biblical definition of repentance. Amen. And now look, I also believe that we should be turning from our sins. That's right. Every day I believe we should be turning from our sins. We have a struggle that we battle against the flesh, the flesh and the spirit. You know, every single day we ought to be dying to ourselves. But you know what? I don't believe that that's required for our salvation. I believe salvation is a free gift. I believe God gave it to us for free because he paid for all of it on the cross. We just have to receive it. The faith of a child, that's what gets us saved. Mark chapter 1, look at verse number 4. John did baptize in the wilderness and preached the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. For your sins being paid for. In order to receive salvation, John preached the baptism of repentance. Verse number 14. Jump down to verse number 14. That's what he preached. The baptism of repentance. Look at verse 14. Now after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of, he of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. And this is what, um, you know, when, when I was challenging the person yesterday on, on, on just repentance, well, the Bible says you have to repent and believe the gospel. Yes, it does. That's exactly what it says. Where's the reference to sin here? Where does it say you have to repent of your sins and believe the gospel? Again, we already covered the word repent all alone in and of itself does not have anything to do with sins. Otherwise, God's a sinner. God repents. It can't have anything inherently to do with sin. You have to gauge what this is talking about based on the context. And again, mark this down, Mark chapter 1, read the whole thing in context and show me where sin is being mentioned and, and tying that in with the repentance. I think the context is showing us repent and believe the gospel. Repent ye, change what you're believing in, and believe the gospel because the gospel is what's going to save you, not any of your other beliefs, not your phony religion. That is the direct context of the word repent in this verse. And this is, talk, again, verses about salvation and repentance is what, we're, is what we're focusing on here in the New Testament. Turn to Luke chapter 3. We see another reference of John the Baptist. Luke chapter 3, verse number 2, the Bible reads, Annas and Caiaphas, being the high priest, the word of God, came unto John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness, and he came into all the country about Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Exact same phrase that we saw in Mark chapter 1. Now jump down to verse number 7. Then said he to the multitude that came forth to be baptized of him, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? And again, he's referring now to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, right? He's saying, well, who's warned you about this? You're from the wrath to come. Look at verse number 8. Bring forth, therefore, fruits worthy of repentance, and begin not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. So the repentance necessary for these Pharisees and Sadducees that he's calling out and saying, you know what, you need to bring forth fruit worthy of repentance. You know, you need to exhibit that you actually believe this. And he says, and think not to say within yourselves, 
oh, well, Abraham's our father. What were they trusting in? Their heritage. They were trusting in the fact that they were Jews. They were trusting in the fact that they were God's chosen people and thought that that was going to give them a free pass into heaven, that because they are physically children of Abraham, that somehow that means anything in God's eyes. And John the Baptist is saying, look, don't trust in your heritage. Don't trust in your genealogy because God's able these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. That means nothing is basically what that means. So you see this rock over here? Yeah, God can raise that up to be a child of Abraham. That's not what's going to get you saved at all. But that's what they were trusting in. That's what they were relying on. And that's why they needed to repent. They repent. They needed to change what they believed. Turn, if you would, to Acts chapter 19. And this is very real. And if you don't have this memorized or marked down, this is, this is a very important sermon for soul winning because I'll tell you what, you run into a lot of Potter's House people, but most of the time you're not going to be able to talk to them anyways. Not all the time. I mean, I try to talk to all of them whenever I can. But um, a lot of them are, are really, I mean, they're, they're really heavily indoctrinated and do not, most of the time don't even want to talk to you. But there's plenty of people that are sucked into this repent of your sin salvation. Now, I just want to make this note real quick because I forgot to mention it earlier. I have heard many people say repent of your sins for salvation that didn't actually believe in a works-based salvation. Right. And the reason why they say that is just because they've heard it over and 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 over again. So when somebody says you have to repent of your sins and be saved, it's a red flag that pops up in my mind, but that doesn't automatically mean that they're not saved. Because what they believe in their heart is what really matters. Sometimes people say things without really thinking in depth of what the actual meaning is of what they're saying. And they're hearing, you know, they're repeating what they've heard over and over again, maybe in whatever church they've been to. I mean, there's plenty of Baptist churches out there that say you have to repent of your sins and be saved. Right. And I pin people down on this. And when you get down to it, people say, oh, well, no, you don't have, you know, it's like, well, what does repent mean? And this is, a, this is also what I brought up to the other guy. I said, well, define repent for me because I, it's important for you to tell me what it means. He said, well, turn from your sins. I said, well, have you turned from your sins? He said, yes. I said, well, do you still sin? So, of course. If you still sin, you have not turned from all of your sins. It's not a difficult concept to grasp. He's having a hard time understanding that. But look, if I could say that I've turned from my sins, if I go back and sin, I did not turn from them because I'm still sinning. I mean, in order to turn from them, I would have to not do them anymore. I mean, it's as simple as that. Now, we should be turning from our sins. I, look, I, I want to do that. I'm trying to do that. But I'm never going to do that as long as I have this flesh. Mm -hmm. Completely. I mean, it's just not going to happen. Which is why it's not the requirement for salvation because then nobody's saved. That's right. Amen. But Acts chapter 19, keep, make a note of this verse. Right? Anyone who has soul, anyone who talks to people about repentance and people who want to bring up, well, John the Baptist preached repentance and you need to repent in order to be saved. This is an extremely clear um, definition or, or teaching of, of what the Apostle Paul tells us specifically that John the Baptist was actually teaching when he, when he preached about repentance. Look at verse number 4 of Acts 19. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance. He brings it up. The baptism of repentance, saying unto the people. So when he baptized the baptism of repentance, he said to the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. Amen. The baptism of repentance that John the Baptist was preaching was belief on Christ. Right. It wasn't turning from your wicked ways. It wasn't getting sin out of your life. It was believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, which is consistent with every other salvation scripture in the Bible. And I'm not quite there yet in the sermon, but I just want to bring up this point. Think about this for a minute. Now, if you have verse, verses in some areas saying one thing, and then verses in another area saying something different, and you think that they're saying two different things, you've got yourself a contradiction. Now, the God that I believe in doesn't have contradictions in His Word. I believe that God's Word is preserved for us perfectly, so if I think there's a contradiction somewhere, then I'm not understanding something correctly. When you see verses that say, 
You need to repent and believe for a salvation. And then you see, you know, John 3, 16, For God so loved the world, they gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. No word of repentance, no word of sin, no word of anything. Just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. When you see these two things, if you're thinking that, well, wait, repent means to turn from your sins, but none of these other verses say anything about turning from sins, you don't understand repentance. In that context, at least. Because, like I said, there's other contexts that are talking about turning from your sins. But those are never talking about our eternal salvation. At best, what you're going to find is a nation's salvation, like we started off with in Jeremiah 18. That is how a nation is saved, through their works. That is not how people are saved. And then flip over this one page, Acts chapter 20. You're in Acts 19 already. Make note of that Acts 19.4. It's really important to show people that that is what the, bap the, the repentance that John the Baptist was preaching because it's clear. Verse 18, Acts chapter 20. And when they were come to him, he said unto them, Ye know from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mind, and with many tears and temptations which befell me by the lying and weight of the Jews, and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you, and have taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I don't have anything new to add about this. I'm just kind of trying to go over these verses that refer to repentance in the New Testament in regards to salvation because that's obviously what he's do, talking about here. That's what the Jews and the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. He's talking about salvation. But again, no reference to sin, no reference to giving up evil deeds or evil works for, you know, in regards to this repentance whatsoever. But you see repentance and faith tied together. Because the repentance necessary involves your faith, not your works. That is the required repentance. Amen. Turn, if you would, to Hebrews chapter 6. And this is such a simple doctrine, but it's been attacked. It's a subtle attack, and that's why, it, that's why it's, it's been so widely um, accepted by many people. Is because it's, it's, um, it's, it's a real... It's a real tricky attack. And, and, you know, the devil likes to use words like repent that aren't, you know, especially in modern day where people, it's not being used on a regular basis. I mean, when's the last time you had a conversation with someone other than talking about the Bible where they use the word repent or you yourself? I mean, it just, we just don't use it in our language today, which, is, which makes it that much easier for those words to be distorted and, and false doctrine to be taught when you don't have a very good grasp of what the word actually means. Hebrews chapter 6, verse number 1, the Bible reads, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. So, you know, people always say, oh, you need to turn from sin to the Savior. You need to repent of your sins and turn to Jesus Christ. And, and, and that's the, the substitution they make from repent and believe on Jesus Christ. But that's a, it's a false um, substitution. If you want to look at any substitution here, this is a great definition, again, of what needs to be repented of and what you need to be saved. Repentance from dead works. What's a dead work? It's a work without faith. The Bible says in James chapter 2, faith without works is dead. Well, works without faith is dead also. We need to repent of our dead works. The works that we think are going to save us. Us being such a good person. Us being obedient to God's law. Us following the footsteps of Christ. Us doing whatever. If you don't have faith in Jesus Christ, those are all dead works. The Bible says in Hebrews 11, 6, you don't have to turn there, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Without faith, you cannot please God. So these people who, they don't have all of their faith in Christ, but they think that by obeying God's commandments, they're pleasing God and God's going to let them into heaven. Without faith, they can't please God. It's impossible. And James chapter 2 said, Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. 
Dead faith is faith without works. Dead works is works without faith. Now, of course, we should do the works. Turn to Acts chapter 26. I know we're turning to a lot of scriptures this morning, but you need, you need to see these. A lot of times I'll read through passages and stuff, but I want you to turn to these places and look at them for yourself. This is an important doc. I mean, this is, this is a core doctrine. We're talking about salvation. This is, there, there, you know, there is no more important doctrine than what must I do to be saved. I mean, the Bible is full of important doctrines, but this is the most important doctrine. And this has been attacked by many workers of Satan, by many children of Belial. They're out there, and they're out there promoting this, and they're active. And like I said, I mean, at Potter's House, they're putting on these shows, they're putting on these concerts, they open up these nightclubs, they do all these different things trying to suck people in. This is the spiritual battle we're engaged in. This is what we're fighting against. Their mouths must be stopped. We need to be preaching the truth of God's word because, look, if no one's out there preaching the truth and all you have is just a bunch of people spreading lies and they're spreading lies from a bullhorn, there's going to be a lot more people deceived. You know, we need to combat that with the truth. Look at Acts chapter 26, verse number 19. As I was mentioning, you know, um, you know, we need repentance of, from dead works and faith toward God. And, and just real briefly, I'm not, I'm not going to spend very much time on this. A lot of people get confused by James 2, because the Bible says faith without works is dead. Well, of course, it's a true statement. Faith without works is dead. But nowhere in that passage does it say that you lose your salvation. And nowhere does it say you have to keep doing works in order to be saved. It's not what it says. Your faith can die, but it doesn't mean God takes away his loving kindness from you, which he said he'll never do. It doesn't mean that God removes eternal life from you, which he already gave you the moment that you believed, the moment you put your faith in him, you receive eternal life. He doesn't make you unborn. From the moment you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you were born again. You have a new creature born inside of you. God doesn't kill that creature if your faith dies. He just wants you to get back to work and, and get your faith lively again. Look at Acts chapter 26, verse number 19. Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision, but showed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coasts of Judea, and then to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. So he's explaining himself of what he's doing, and he's telling him that he was, he was preaching two things, two separate things. One, they need to repent and turn to God. They need to get saved. They need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And two, do works meet for repentance. And you know what? I preach that. Amen. Any Bible preacher is going to preach that yeah, you got to get saved, but you know what? Your whole life isn't just about being saved yourself, right? Once you're born into God's family, why don't you start acting like a child of God? Why don't you start doing works meet for repentance? Why don't you start showing other people that you are saved, that you are born again, and live a life according to God's word? There's a whole package in the Bible. It's not just about your salvation is the most important thing. That's why the first thing you preach is repent and believe in God. You know, repent, turn to God. But then you need to do works for repentance. Um, you know, like Acts chapter 2, Acts 2.38, the people who want to tell you you've got to repent of your sins and be saved is a, is a real popular passage. But we're going to start reading in verse number 37. Acts 2.37 says, Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? So the question is, what should we do, right? What shall we do? It means, what should we do? What should we do? What's the answer? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the, Holy, the gift of the Holy Ghost. It's a great answer. What should we do? Hey, repent and then get baptized. Great answer. Does that mean you have to get baptized in order to be saved, though? No. And again, in this context, does it say anything about sins? No, it just says the word repent. Now again, you could say, well, what's he talking about there? Well, you have to look at the context. You have to read the whole thing in, in context and see what's he referring to there. I don't see anything about sins. But contrast that 
of Acts 2.37, what shall we do? With Acts 16, verse 30 and 31, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Which question is a little bit more clear? If you're going to get your salvation doctrine, are you going to go to the one where someone's answering a question, what should we do? Or are you going to go to the one that says, what must I do to be saved? My salvation doctrine comes from what must I do to be saved? That's a very clear, specific question. And their answer was, and they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. Very simple answer. Very straightforward. Doesn't even, again, doesn't even use the word repent. The repentance is implied because your belief might, you know, is on something else. But the actual action, the actual requirement is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Right. That is the condition for salvation. It's very simple. Now, turn if you would to Jonah chapter 3. You know, I mentioned this before. It's our Bible memory verse. You say, why in the world are we learning Jonah chapter 3? Well, as I mentioned, I, I brought up the story. And we're going to read it. You know the book of Jonah. Everyone knows the book of Jonah from Jonah and the whale, right? Jonah gets swallowed by the whale. And that's what you, you learned that as a kid because it's a kind of a fun story. It's a weird story. You know, Jonah got thrown over the boat and this whale comes, swallows him up. He's in the side of the whale's belly for three days and three nights and he spits him out on land. You know, everyone can remember that story. So why are we learn Jonah chapter 3? It's not even the part about the whale. Well, the whole point of, of Jonah is that God was sending him to preach a message unto Nineveh because they were a wicked nation. God wanted them to repent. He wanted them to change. He was giving them an opportunity to not be destroyed. Jonah didn't want to do it. That's why he was swallowed by the whale. And, and, and he got right with God after three days and three nights in the whale's belly. And then he went and preached the message. We're going to read this here in Jonah chapter 3. Look at verse, we're starting reading verse number 4. The Bible reads, And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey. And he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. That's his message. He's saying, if you've got forty days, God's going to overthrow the city of Nineveh. Verse number 5. So the people of Nineveh, look at this, believed God. Right. The first thing they did, they heard the message, what did they do? They believed God. And proclaimed a fast. And put on sackcloth from the greatest of them, even to the least of them. For word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne. And he laid his robe from him and covered him with sackcloth and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn everyone from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. He heard the message. He says, I believe that. He believed the truth. He believed what was being preached. And as a result of that belief, he decided to, hey, let's repent. Let's change our ways. Let's get right with God. Let's, let's put on sackcloth and ashes. You know, they're grieving. They're mourning. They're trying to express to God their sorrow, and that they're, you know, they're not going to be wicked anymore. And that's what they're trying to get across to God so that the whole city of Nineveh would be spared. And look at verse number 9. Verses number 9 and 10 are extremely important. Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? And God saw their works that they turned from their evil way and God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. If you study your Bible, you're going to find the passages, I mentioned this before, that refer to people repenting of their sins. Just as it is here in Jonah, it's never for an individual's eternal salvation. God repented in this story. God didn't destroy Nineveh. Why did he not destroy Nineveh? Because in verse 10 it says, And God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way. So what did they do? They turned from their evil way. Is that another way of saying turning from your sin? I think so. They turned from their evil way. What did God call that? Their works. Their works. You want to tell me you've got to turn from your sins in order to be saved? The Bible defines that very act as doing works. Amen. 
But the Bible says in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Right. So which is it? Do we have to turn from our sins in order to be saved? No. That's what the nation has to do. That's what America has to do. America has to turn from their wickedness for God not to judge America. But the individual, you need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what you, you need to change your mind about whatever it is you're believing in. For me, I was believing and I was a good person. Like most people. That's just, I, I thought I was pretty good. Wasn't that bad. Pretty obedient kid. You know, listened, you know, got into a little bit of trouble, but who doesn't, you know? That was my, this is my thought process. But, you know, I'm, I mean, I'm saved. I, I, you know, even ask me, I would say, yeah, I believe in Jesus. That's not what I was trusting in for my salvation, though. I needed to repent. And I did. I changed my mind. I heard the truth. I said, you know what? I believe that. And I put all my faith on Jesus Christ. There's the repentance. Amen. Praise the Lord. Remember these verses. Jonah chapter 3. Do the Bible. And if you don't, you know, if you have problems with memory or something, learn verses 9 and 10 at least. Okay, at least. Do these ones. Try to get the whole chapter done. Get the whole thing. You'll have the whole thing in context. You'll learn a lot from it. You'll understand it better. Verses 9 and 10, though, because when someone tells me I have to repent for my sins, I always turn to this because there's so much here. For one, it shows God repenting. Right. It shows God repenting. So you could say, does God sin? No. Well, right here in this passage, God repents. So then what does repent mean? And number two, you could, if anyone's going to be honest with Scripture, you can see the definition of turning from your wicked ways being works. And if you're going to be honest with your belief, if you're going to say you have to turn from your evil way in order to be saved, then you have to say that you believe in work salvation. But nobody wants to do that because they know there's a mountain of scriptures that say it's not based on our works. I'm just going to read through. Look, if we have to turn from our sins to be saved, what about Ephesians 2? I already quoted to you. Acts 16, I already quoted to you. John 3, 16. John 3, 18, it says, Yo, He that believeth on him is not condemned, and he that believeth not... Um, is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. How about he that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. John 5, 24, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. John 6, 47, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. John 7, 38, He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. John eleven twenty five. 25, Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? Romans 3, 28, Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Romans 4, 5, But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Romans 5, 1, Therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 10, 4, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness righteousness to everyone that believeth. Romans 10, 13, 14, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? Galatians 2, 16, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Galatians 3, 11, But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident, for the just shall live by faith. That's a small sample from the Bible regarding verses on salvation, eternal life. Where did I ever say the word repent in any of those verses? Not once. Now again, I believe that repentance is necessary, but it's not talking about turning from your sins. So the problem is if you want to call repentance turning from your sins, then what do you do with all those verses that never use the word repent? What I'm saying is it goes hand in hand with believe in the sense that you're changing what you believe from belief in anything other than Christ to belief in Christ. And it makes perfect sense and it fits just fine all throughout Scripture. All of those Scriptures can all be true at the same time with that understanding. But if you're going to say that repenting of your sins is what it's talking about, why is sin never mentioned or repentance in any of those verses? Just belief. 
Those verses can't be true on their own. All those verses I just read to you, you'd have to have some other context or some other reference in there in order for the repent of your sins doctrine to be true regarding salvation. Right. It's completely false. Don't get suckered into this false belief. Don't, get, don't, don't, don't let someone hoodwink you into this. And look, we need to stand up for the truth and challenge people. Now look, when people say you got to repent of your sins, my first reaction is just, first of all, just get, it, get a clear understanding. As I mentioned before, I've talked to many people that have told me that you've repented of your sins to be saved, they were actually saved. Because the further I dug and the further I did, you know, I said, oh, well, no, you don't have to, you know, you don't have to do works to be saved or you don't have to, give, you know, give up all of your sins to be saved. And they kind of, well, what happens is the preaching is like, well, you got to kind of want to try to not sin anymore. And it's like, look. And I always say, well, what if someone doesn't? What if someone puts all of their faith in Jesus Christ, but they still go out and sin? Are they saved? That's a pretty good question to ask. Because if people believe in a work salvation, they'll say no. People who actually believe right, they say, well, no, yeah, you could still do that and be saved. Because it's true. Look, if I want to go out today and just go out and get drunk and commit adultery, I'm still saved. I don't want to do that, but if I did do that, God's already given me eternal life. It's a free gift. It's paid for. It doesn't make me unsaved. But it's not something we should do. We should be repenting of our sins daily, but again, not for salvation. Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the clear teaching of your word, dear God. I pray that you please help us all to be good students of your word. Help us all to, to read diligently, dear Lord, and to challenge people when they, when they come up to us with a doctrine, especially one like this, where people are trying to pervert the gospel and add works to our salvation, dear Lord. Help us to remember to challenge them and say, well, show me where the Bible actually says that and that we can look carefully at your words and discern whether or not what we're being told is true. Dear God, I pray that you would please help all of us to be challenging of the things that we hear and rely and trust completely in your word for our, for our truth and for our guidance, dear Lord. We thank you so much for the free gift of eternal life. It's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.